right? everyone. So um, if you're just joining in on the fun, uh, we loved this little intro, seeing everybody in their Halloween costumes. Um, I'm Shannon Keenan. I'm the Director of Development and Events with SCWF. Um, in case you couldn't tell, I'm currently dressed up as Poison Ivy. Um, Jay, who will be teaching our class today, will tell you a little bit about his costume in a second. A couple ground rules for today's presentation. Um, we love questions. Um, if you can put your questions in the chat box, though, I will jump on the screen and I will interact with Jay and ask him your questions. Um, I do try to get to every question. If for some reason Jay is moving on and we're covering a different topic, don't worry. We will stay after and we will answer your questions. Um, we hope that you all learn a bunch about Halloween Creepy Crawlies. We also want to thank um, Bass Pro Shops and Cabela's Outdoor Fund. They were our awesome sponsor, um, making this class possible. They normally sponsor our women's outdoor retreat. So we are thankful to have them supporting us so that we can bring you these free webinars. We do have a ton of um, other videos on our uh, website, and I'll make sure when I send the follow-up email today that you've got a link to our other classes. Um, but this one is being recorded, assuming there's no tech glitches, and we'll make sure that everyone gets a recording of this class too. Otherwise, I'm gonna turn it over to Jay. All right, thanks a lot, Shannon. I'm gonna share my screen here. And let's see, I'm gonna do this. All right, you should be able to see the entire screen. Um, give me just one second to minimize something. All right. So yeah, so my name is Jay Keck. Um, I am the Habitat Education Manager with South Carolina Wildlife Federation. Um, and I love talking about animals. Um, <clears throat> I'm a bird guy, so you know that, those are my favorite. But uh, um, close second are snakes. Uh, the insects are fantastic. I'm probably more of a caterpillar, moth, butterfly guy than anything else. Uh, but I like things that have a lot of color and uh, <laughs> fly mostly, even though, uh, you know, snakes obviously don't. Although there is one snake, I think, uh, out, out in Asia somewhere that can propel itself off of trees and uh, kind of wiggle in the air and it can actually glide. So that's pretty cool. Um, but I'm actually dressed today uh, in one of my hunting suits, but I'm going to pretend that it is a wax myrtle, which is a which is a cool plant that we have here in South Carolina. Uh, in the old days, uh, folks used to uh, boil down the <clears throat> the berries or the seeds uh, and extract this uh, or separate this this waxy material and, and make candles out of them. Um, and they actually still still do in in certain areas. Um, but uh, you know, it's an important food source. Uh, whenever I think of uh, birds coming down here uh, in the winter. I always think of something called a, a yellow rumped warbler. It, it, a lot of people call it a butter butt because it looks like somebody just took a slab of butter and, and popped, it, popped it on its uh, fanny. But uh, they, uh, it's one of the warblers that don't have to go down to um, South America or Central America, Mexico for the winter because um, one of the things it can do is, is eat seeds. Um, you know, you'll find it at your feeders, but if you have a plant uh, like like uh, wax myrtle with all the berries, um, you'll uh, you'll probably have those uh, birds coming in the winter time. Um, and I have my uh, little copperhead right here that is uh, hanging out in the wax myrtle. It's either resting or uh, you know it's just uh, going to ambush maybe a maybe a little frog or a little lizard, um, maybe a cicada or something. So if you see it move, just let me know in the chat box, and uh, I might take it off because I don't I don't want to get bitten. But it's not a real one, obviously. Um, all right, so we're going to talk uh, creepy crawlies of South Carolina. This is a uh, a class that's kind of um, been influenced by the the Halloween season. Uh, it's a great season. I have two young boys, and uh, we we get into it pretty good over here at the house. Um, but I'm going to talk about uh, a little bit, you know, the the creatures that are. You know, some are scary. Uh, some have, you know, kind of uh, strange things that they do. Um, they have <laughs> weird eating habits. Um, and I'm just going to uh, jump right in here. After I say this, we have the logo on each of our pages. Um, and after the presentation, uh, Shannon will send out an email. <clears throat> and whoever can tell us first where all the logos were on each page, uh, we'll send that person um, a, little, a little goodie package. Um, so I'm going to get started here and 
you know, I was mentioning a uh, animals that that have, uh, I guess, some strange attributes. Uh, the milkweed assassin bug is is one of them. There's a lot of different assassin bugs here in in South Carolina. Uh, but this guy, you can't really see it, but it has this mouth part right here, or or you know, it's it's near the mouth um, that it'll it'll use to to stab the prey and in, injects uh, a substance that'll actually dissolve. The insides of that of that uh, insect, and it'll uh, you know slurp it up like a milkshake from um, you know Chick Fil A. <laughs> but uh, you know these bugs, uh, the milkweed assassin bug, um, uh, you can see the coloration here. Um, you know, and it makes me think of you know monarch butterflies that are orange and black, and some aphids that are orange, um, and other creatures like the milkweed tussock moth uh, that. Um, you know, feed on or around milkweed, and they're, they all have this orangish black color. And I'm not sure if that comes from a chemical within the milkweed or if that's just an evolutionary trait because they, they all have, uh, or, or almost all of them have these chemicals that uh, don't taste great um, if, if they're predated upon by another animal. So Jay, you're saying this bug has essentially superpowers and can dissolve <laughs> its prey. I think I did say that. <laughs> wow, wow. What's an example of a bug that this assassin bug might try and eat? Uh, you know, the larger ones, there's one called a wheel bug, um, and it's in the same family, and they'll eat, you know, um, grasshoppers, they'll eat uh, caterpillars, and uh, yeah, if, you know, they, they will um, uh, bite you, or I guess stick you with this, um, you know, and it will hurt because of that uh, substance that they'll, they'll inject into you, but um, usually just a quick clean um, will we'll take care of that. It's not like getting, you know, uh, bitten by a, by a black widow um, or even a, even a wasp, but you do have to be careful. Um, we have these beautiful American alligators here in South Carolina. And, uh, you know, I'm a huge Harry Potter fan, and this is a, a venomous species that we have here in South Carolina. It's a water moccasin. And, uh, you know, it always makes me think of uh, Nagini or Nagini, you know, from the, from the books, from the movies. And uh, I think they must have used an anaconda to represent Nagini. But, uh, boy, I think it would have been a, a lot better if they would have used a venomous species like this. I think it's a little bit more, uh, a little spookier than, uh, than the snake species that they used in the movie. But we'll go to the next page here. Um, you know, gosh. Nature is just so amazing and so beautiful. And, uh, you know, it's kind of weird to think of that these creepy and crawlies can, uh, can be, you know, beautiful, uh, gorgeous um, even. And, you know, look at this Cecropia moth caterpillar. That's right here in South Carolina. Um, and look at those uh, formations on it, the blue, the yellow, the, the red with those black spikes. Uh, just a gorgeous, gorgeous species. Um, you have the spiny orb weavers right here, and they were pretty abundant, you know, uh, in the fall time. We, we do have a lot of spiders out here in the fall. Um, and here's a yellow version of the, of the same kind of spider. And then we have green link spiders right here. And whenever you go outside, and you can find all these in your yard, <clears throat> uh, maybe not the, the caterpillars, uh, unless you have, you know, oak trees, uh, black cherry trees, uh, some of the plants that they, the caterpillars eat. Um, but you can go to small plants and, and find these guys. Uh, the green link spider is fun to watch. If you find one on a, on a plant in your yard, uh, it kind of sits and waits as an ambu ambush hunter. Um, and I, I just remember the first time I saw one, I was, I was looking at a plant of mine that we have in our yard called Bone Set. And it has these beautiful white flowers. A lot of insects come to it. A lot of pollinators come to it. And I thought the plant had a growth on it. And I went to go grab the growth just to see what it was. If it was squishy, hard, it had something in it. And it ended up being a very large link spider, which, you know, uh, I think spiders are beautiful at a distance. Uh, they they kind of give me the, the creeps a little bit. But, um, you know, I just left it alone and watched it. And every now and then you'll see them actually catch and, uh, and consume uh, it, its prey. So pretty neat. Yes, ma'am. Isabel wants to know what the green link spider eats. Uh, yeah, so it'll eat other insects. Um, I don't know if it'll eat other spiders, probably, right? Um, if it can fit it in its mouth and uh, it, it won't damage the, the actual green link spider. Um, uh, I've seen them uh, take, you know, small, small bees or small wasps that come to the flower. So you'll, a lot of times you'll see these smaller critters uh, hanging out by the flowers because things come to the flowers to, to get the nectar or the pollen and they'll ambush uh, uh, from, from a hiding place. 
and uh, just really neat to watch. It makes me also think about a, a crab spider that we have. One's called a goldenrod crab spider that'll sit in the flowers, and some of them are yellow, and it just camouflages perfectly with the uh, with the flowers. So I know we've got quite a few first-time viewers on our webinar today. So let's not forget to use the chat box if you have a question. But I want to know because September and October are such good months for spiders and spider webs. Who has walked into a spider web on their way to their car with their mom and dad or just walking outside to play? Has anybody noticed a spider's web that was never there before? Isabel has, Michael has, Katie has, Jasper has. Yeah, those spiders are pretty active right now. And again, you know, I'm, I'm a little scared, right, of spiders. Um, they have eight legs. That kind of creeps me out a little bit. But boy, they are absolutely stunning. Some of them are. You know, some of them are just, are just brown, um, and they're not too much to look at. But there are, you know, these jumping spiders we have. Um, I'm a big fan of a bird called a warbler. There's over 50 species of them. They have, uh, there are all sorts of colors, blue, orange, yellow, um, you know, black. And, uh, you know, these jumping spiders to me are kind of like the warblers of the, the spider family. So, um, you know, they can just be stunning, stunning creatures. And, and look at this guy here, you know, the Polymedes uh, swallowtail caterpillar. Um, it, it has these fake false eyes, right? Um, and so if I'm a bird and I'm looking for caterpillars and I see this guy, I'm, I'm like, okay, this, <laughs> this one has spikes. I might not eat that one. And this one, you know, kind of mimics a snake. You know, we have that rough green snake, a green snake that uh, is arboreal. And a lot of times you'll find it in uh, above the ground, right in bushes or trees. And, uh, you know, if, I, if I'm a small bird, I might just leave this guy alone. So it's just an adaptation that's really cool um, to protect it from predators. We've got a couple of good comments in here. Tyler actually said he found the spiny orb weeder, the spiny back orb weaver in his backyard and he ran into one on his bicycle. Oh no. <laughs> and then Margaret wants to know what are the spiky things on that caterpillar and what purpose do they serve? No. Um, so again, if, if, I'm a, if I'm a bird and I see this uh, spider, I'm probably going to think twice about approaching it um, if, it's, if it's not in its web, if it might be, you know, crawling on a leaf. Um, so, you know, I would imagine um, it's for protection um, to deter other animals from, from eating it. Um, you know, I, I'm not a, I'm not a entomologist, so I don't study insects or arachnids. Um, I know a little bit about them, uh, but I'm not sure if it, it might be used for, for breeding, you know, the, the brighter the colors maybe it shows, you know, the healthier the, the, that actual, you know, one is, um, which might be attractive to its mate. I'm not sure, but, um, uh, you know, look, look at this though. It, it has almost a, a facial um, expression on it. So, uh, you know, that's even going to deter some, some predators from approaching that, that spider. And Caroline and Parker want to know if that uh, green link spider would bite you. Uh, they, they can, um, I believe, you know, anything that has a mouth. Our snake expert said this once in a class because they, he, somebody asked, you know, if a, if a, a snake will bite you. Um, I forgot which species. And he said, anything that has a mouth could bite you. So, you know, treat it, <laughs> treat nature like, like with, with, with that in mind. Keep that in mind always. Um, and if you're not sure if something will bite you, just don't touch it. Um, so am I going to touch a green link spider? No. Uh, one, because I'm not a huge fan of handling spiders. And then two, um, I always, always kind of just think that each, each species can bite you. Um, but I do think they can. I don't want to say that they will, um, but I do think that they can. Tyler also wants to know if the green link spider glows in the dark, which is a great question. You know, I don't think it actually glows in the dark, but a lot of spiders, if you go out at night, one, one thing that's really fun to do is go out at night with a flashlight and just kind of um, shine the grass and shine the pine straw. If you have a bit of wood surround your house, uh, shine the leaf litter, okay, uh, under the trees. And you'll see all these eyes that are glowing, kind of like a deer whenever you see uh, a deer on the road. You know, you see those eyes glowing or, or your dog or cat. And, um, you know, they, they reflect that light and it looks like, I mean, I think it's beautiful. It looks like a lot of stars are, are just lying in the grass or lying in the, in the pine straw. So um, I don't think the spider actually glows, although in the daytime, it just, I mean, it's stunningly uh, green and it almost glows. But at night, I'm, I'm pretty sure, you know, it, it doesn't have, it, it doesn't glow. 
We had one question asking us what our favorite spiders were. And since you said that about the flashlight, if you've never seen a wolf spider, you can shine a wolf spider in your yard and they're pretty cool to see at night with their red beady eyes in the grass. All right. Yeah, get out there uh, with your parents and, and search the grass, um, search the leaf litter, and you'll you'll find uh, you know all these eyes staring back at you, and it's uh, it's really fun to fun to watch. My favorite spider, to answer your question, is a jumping spider. They're, they're, that is the only spider that I will handle. I love them, um, and they they jump. I actually I, I didn't put the video on, but just the other day we were walking with my family. Again, I have two two boys and a wife, and. Um, we uh, saw a jumping spider and I actually saw it jump from a leaf and catch uh, just a small flying insect and propel down uh, to the ground or rappel down to the ground on web on its, you know, silk and uh, consume it. So uh, I got to see it catch, leap and uh, catch, catch a flying insect. Uh, so you, you just never know, you know, what you're going to see out there in this, in this, you know, tiny world of, of insects and, and arachnids. Um, remember guys, there is a logo on each of these pages. This one's kind of tricky. So, um, kind of tri trip y'all up a little bit, but the creepies can be bizarre, right? Look at this praying mantis. Um, you know, and they call it praying because of this, this feature right here. Um, and I have a picture of one of our lizards, you know, the native lizard to, uh, to South Carolina or one of them. Um, another one's a, a eastern fence lizard. Um, it's really beautiful, the males. But uh, this one's in, a, I call it an, an anole. Uh, some people call it anoles. Um, but this one can, can be brown or, or green. It can, it can change colors. Um, and so I have this on here and I have this uh, tree frog on here as well because, you know, these big praying mantis, uh, some of them can actually take, take a uh, lizard and take a frog and, and catch it and, and feed upon it. Um, so think about that, an insect feeding on a vertebrate, you know, an insect, um, you know, this praying mantis doesn't, it, it's not a vertebrate, it doesn't have, have vertebrae, right? Um, although it can turn its head uh, 180 degrees, and I'm not quite sure how it does, um, but, uh, you know, it's kind of interesting to think about an insect feeding on something, you know, that has muscle, that has, you know, bones, uh, and this guy right here can. So we have a few, I think three or four different kind of uh, mantis here or mantids here in uh, on the eastern part of the United States. Um, <clears throat> uh, a couple of them are introduced. Uh, the Carolina mantis is our native mantis, okay? And it's only about two, two inches to two and a quarter inches uh, in length. Its larger cousin, the Chinese mantis, came to the United States in the, the late 1800s. I think 1896 was the year. And I believe it came in through plants uh, that went to a nursery around Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. Uh, but it can sometimes reach five inches in length. So when you think about a praying mantis consuming uh, one of those lizards or a, uh, a frog, you know, that, that mantis can, you know, be four to five inches long. Um, and those frogs, you know, maybe an inch and a half, you know, sometimes you'll see one of those liz lizards as a baby, they're only a couple inches long. Um, so you can kind of see how they could take a, take a vertebrate like that. Another species that was found, um, or that's found in Eastern North America is the European mantis. Um, and that was introduced uh, as a form of pest control. I think it was brought over here to control uh, gypsy moths, uh, if, I, if I can remember correctly. Uh, but that's another larger one. And, you know, I guess, you know, people, people like praying mantis in their gardens because they, they uh, supposedly eat pests that you don't want, you know, feeding on your, your vegetables. Um, but, you know, these guys are a lot bigger than our native one, and, and I would imagine these, these will consume uh, the Carolina mantis. So, um, you know, I try not to, to introduce anything to our yard, even though this was taken in our yard. I don't know if y'all can see that mantis. It's actually a video I'm going to play in a second. Um, but I try not to introduce those uh, foreign species um, into our yard, uh, just because, you know, I'd like to see the, the um, species that are native to, to South Carolina. But uh, <clears throat> check this mount. Uh, this is a Chinese uh, mantis, I would imagine, uh, because of its size. It's huge. Uh, that was on some uh, uh, perennial in our in our yard. And I'm going to play the video here. It's feeding on a wasp. Watch its mouth parts. I mean, come on, y'all. That's creepy. That is a Halloween creature right there. And look at this brave fly or, you know, some small bee or some small wasp that's on the praying mantis. It's quite brave and it'll, it'll get all the way up to its, uh, 
uh, chin. So it's eating on, on, a, on a wasp. And, and again, this is a Chinese mantis, so it's not from here. So, you know, it's, it's feeding on something that, that would be beneficial, a po pollinator. So is it a good thing to have these mantis around? Um, you know, that's, that's debatable. Yes, ma'am. We have a lot of people agreeing that that is super creepy. Um, Dave wants to know what does a mantis eat other than um, those wasps there? So they eat insects. Um, they eat other mantis uh, or mantids. So, you know, think about a, uh, an egg case. Um, it has a bizarre word. I can't remember what it's called, uh, but look it up. It's pretty cool. Um, and they can have, you know, a hundred, maybe a few hundred, um, you know, eggs. And then all of a sudden they, they, they uh, emerge, right? And the, the ones that come out first, they, they harden quicker um, or earlier than the other ones. So sometimes they'll predate upon the ones that emerge, you know, uh, later, uh, because the ones that are, have just emerged are, are soft and tender, and so they'll eat each other. Um, and that's why, you know, uh, I say, you know, some of these, these other introduced ones might not be so great for the Carolina mantis, which is a lot smaller. Um, but mainly their, their diet is, uh, is insects, um, but they'll eat small snakes. You think about our, our worm snake that we have, maybe a baby ring neck, neck snake, uh, maybe a baby decay or a brown snake that we have. Um, they'll even eat hummingbirds, y'all. And think about that. Our, our two to two and a quarter inch native um, uh, mantis probably isn't going to eat a hummingbird. But these Chinese mantis, I've seen pictures. Um, there's probably, you go to YouTube, there's probably a, a video of it. Um, they'll, they'll eat our um, ruby-throated uh, hummingbirds or maybe some other hummingbirds out west um, if that Chinese mantis has gone out there. Um, I would imagine it is. Um, a lot of people are freaked out by the fact that a praying mantis could eat a hummingbird. And uh, Isabel says, what monsters? You're right, Isabel. What monsters? Who thought when we had a Halloween class that you would learn that a praying mantis is a bit of a nature monster? Isabel, thank goodness these <laughs> things are like four, five, six feet long because I would probably stay in my house all the time. <laughs> Uh, but you can handle these guys. Um, you know, it's a, it's a great species to kind of interact with, um, even though they look um, ferocious, uh, you know, they're, they're harmless to us. So, um, you know, they're, they're great species to, to kind of connect, um, to get us to connect to nature with um, and just watch. Uh, you know, my, my wife loves the outdoors, um, but she's, she's in sales. Um, so her job doesn't have anything to do with it. Um, but she loves, I love finding her looking for the praying mantis. It's one of her favorite species that we have in our yard and we have a few acres. Uh, she's not a, a bird nerd like I am, but she loves her insects, especially the praying mantis. So every now and then I'll find her, uh, you know, bent down and, and looking for these things. And y'all can do the same. Anybody can bend down, right? Um, and, and look at plants um, and just think about this world that's, that's happening, this, this, these lives that are being lived out every single day. Um, just trying to stay or just trying to survive, trying to either avoid being eaten or, you know, trying to find something to eat. It's really neat. Now, we did have someone in the comments say they were going to kill a praying mantis when they saw it. And maybe now is a good time to briefly mention the importance of our insects and how they fit into our ecosystem. Sure. Um, you know, and, and I think I, I see a lot of snakes that are killed. Um, by people and, and it's usually out of fear. And so I think fear drives us to, to eliminate other creatures. Uh, but think about how these creatures fit into the ecosystem. Um, you know, birds are in decline. Um, a lot of uh, reptiles and amphibians are in decline. Um, and most of these animals, these larger vertebrates that we're talking about, they feed upon, you know, insects. So this, this big uh, praying mantis right here, um, if it's flying and they do, um, you know, can, can be taken by uh, bats, they can be taken by owls, um, they can be taken by all sorts of birds. Um, you know, I, even though this guy will eat small snakes, I'm sure larger snakes will, will eat this. So, you know, uh, when you kill it, you're taking it, it, you're taking it out of the food web, you're taking it out of the, the, the ecological system that is almost, it, it works perfectly out there. So think about that, you know, the, ne the next time you kill something out there. I can't hear you, Shannon. There you go. Nina wants to know if a praying mantis can fly. Yes, they can. We were, <laughs> we were at a, uh, a restaurant the other day, sitting outside, socially distanced, 
Um, and all of a sudden we saw something fly um, and it was a praying mantis and it flew uh, right on our table. And our, our kids, you know, screamed at first. We were kind of taken aback just for a second, but then we all went, whoa, it's praying mantis. This is awesome. And so, you know, other people were probably judging us and looking at us funny because we like praying mantis. Um, but yes, they can fly. They're, they're not fantastic flyers because think about how they live. They, am they ambush prey for the most, most part, but they'll sometimes stalk as well. But they, you know, they're green. Um, sometimes they're kind of grayish brown. Um, and you know, their main, um, I guess, mode of transportation is, is walking or just kind of creeping along these plants. But obviously they, they can uh, escape predators, you know, by flying. Even though, you know, this, this, this uh, Halloween pennant, which is the name of this dragonfly is a much better, much better flyer. <clears throat> Um, and that's the reason I put this one on, on theirs, just because it's common name is, is Halloween pennant. And that's one of the, the dragonfly species that we have, that we have right here in South Carolina. And, uh, remember when we're talking about dragonflies, um, think of it as bird food. Um, I love seeing dragonflies around our property just because I know that, you know, this, this beautiful bird, um, you know, it's called a summer tan tanager it comes up here from Central America. It comes up here to breed uh, during the, the, the spring and, and summertime. Now they're back down in, in Central America probably. Um, but it feeds on dragonflies, it feeds on butterflies, it feeds on moths, a lot of wasps actually. Um, so, you know, we want insects in our yard and it's something that we're starting to see more and more people understand. And, you know, that's one of the reasons, or that's one of the things I talk about, you know, in all the classes that I teach is, is the importance of, of insects as food. Um, and I hope y'all y'all start thinking about that. But look at this guy, uh, uh, a buddy of mine. He's a great naturalist down there at Call Call Interpretive Center um, down in, in Charleston. Uh, fantastic uh, a naturalist and a great birder, um, but a great photographer too. He took this. Um, and uh, come on, I'm glad this guy is only, you know, maybe a, a couple inches long at, at most, you know, maybe an inch and a half. But Dobson flies and fish flies. This is probably a female uh, fish fly. <clears throat> um, but uh, how creepy is that? Um, and fish flies, if you read the bottom, fish flies typically don't eat during their short adult lifetime, which I think is around a week long. But they can live for some years um, in their larval stage. And some of these guys can eat, although they, they can eat plant uh, matter, uh, they'll eat animals uh, even as big as, as minnows and, and tadpoles. So think about these insects, you know, eating these, these larger animals. Um, I've, I've seen a dragonfly larva, which lives in the water at first, uh, eat a minnow, and that just blew my mind. Um, but they look like terrifying creatures, and I guess they are to smaller creatures, you know, not so much to us, but, uh, you know, hopefully evolution um, adaptations uh, won't make them bigger in the future. <laughs> So let's talk about uh, some alligators. Let's talk about some big creatures now. Um, you see the range right here, you know, so you have the coast right here, you have the outer coastal plain, and then you have the inner coastal um, plain, and then you have the sand hills probably around right here. And then the Piedmont kind of starts here. Uh, so you, you don't typically have, have alligators unless, you know, maybe somebody transplants one. Um, but, you know, I've seen them in the canal in, in Columbia, um, and that's about as far north as I've seen them, uh, I guess, northwest, you know, from, from the coast. Uh, but pretty abundant down in the, in the coast if, you, if you're a golfer, um, you know, if, if you hit your ball too close to the water, you might want to think twice about retrieving that ball. Uh, just take, take a drop uh, somewhere, somewhere safer. Um, I've had to do that before down in Somerville. Um, uh, but, you know, around here, if you're around Columbia, um, Congaree Creek Heritage Preserve is probably the best place. There's a retention pond in between the actual forest and uh, some homes that, that usually has an has a alligator. It's probably about four or five feet long, but they have seen, you know, 10, 12 foot alligators <clears throat> um, at Congaree Creek Heritage Preserve right there in Casey. It's actually in Lexington County, um, right outside of Columbia. Um, but think about this, uh, you, you know, I always go to bird food, right? Because I'm a bird fanatic, but newly hatched young, they're only, you know, six, eight inches long. And think about bobcats eating alligators and raccoons um, and birds. And we do have a great picture. I didn't include it on this one of an alligator eating another alligator. It was a big alligator eating a smaller alligator. <clears throat> and so these are my kids. And I had them do that, you know, a couple of years ago. And uh, so this one's, his name is Rowan. He's saying, 
hey, the American alligator was placed on the endangered species list in 1967. Uh, it was taken off in 1987 uh, because it rebounded so nicely. So uh, probably commercial hunting um, or illegal hunting. Uh, I'm not sure if it was protected, you know, before then in some way. Um, land or habitat loss, um, habitat degradation, um, you know, probably caused uh, all, all sorts of things caused it to decline dramatically. And then Haynes here, he says, alligators have bounced back though and are abundant throughout much of the low country. Um, and in the Southeast, you know, around 5 million exist. Um, and Florida uh, has both the American alligator and our American crocodile, which isn't as, as large as the crocodiles out in um, Australia and, uh, you know, Africa. Thank, thank goodness. <laughs> yes, ma'am. I want to know in the chat box who's ever seen an alligator before. Uh, Pam says that the Ace Basin at Donnelly Wildlife Management Area is a great place to see them. Um, I've seen them eat a deer before on Fripp Island, um, which was pretty crazy to see a big old alligator eat a whole deer. Yes. Yeah, so Some people have seen them at the zoo and in Edisto. And then Daniel wants to know how strong an alligator's jaw is. And if you don't know the answer, I can look that up. Ooh, I don't know the, uh, the answer to that, but I, I think it's just under like a great white shark. So it's, uh, it's, it's a fantastically powerful bite. Um, but I do know this. They, they go through about 3,000 teeth, I think, in their lifetime. Um, and these are, you know, a lot of these photographs here, guys, um, uh, are from local photographers. We have some, well, uh, almost all of them are from uh, folks from South Carolina, but a lot of the, these uh, phot photographs come from photographers right here um, in the Midlands. So I hope you enjoy them. Oh, you're muted again. So it looks like alligators have bite strength of about 2,125 pounds per square inch, which is actually enough to bite through steel, which is pretty crazy. But <laughs> crazier is that crocodiles can bite even harder than alligators. So you definitely want to stay away from our alligator friends. Just watch them peacefully from afar. Yes, yes, um, because there are some accidents with them every single year, you know, between humans and, and alligators. Um, and this one we weren't, you know, I know it, it looks like we were goofing off, but this was dry, um, this, out, uh, this area behind, um, so there was uh, no, no threat there. Um, but yeah, I am not uh, messing around whenever I, I'm, I'm in alligator uh, country. Um, I'm going to keep my distance from, from them and from the water because uh, I don't want to become prey. That is uh, terrifying to me. <laughs> but we'll go to the next one. So something with four legs, we're going to go to something with no legs to no arms, no legs. You know, we're talking about snakes. And, you know, I have this silly little question down there. What can y'all do? What can you do without using your arms? Uh, using uh, and legs. Um, you know, think about these snakes. They can swim with no uh, uh, arms or legs. They can climb with no arms and legs. They can eat with no arms and legs. Uh, you know, I, I guess I could eat, you know, uh, okay with no arms and legs, but um, you know, think about, think about this, the evolution, um, and snakes have been around for a long time, um, and think about their survivability um, uh, with being able to survive with all these predators around uh, without any, any arms or legs. And, and then think about their camouflage, <clears throat> um, and, uh, which brings me to a story. But we, I was uh, being interviewed uh, to talk about this bird species um, recently, about three weeks ago, and we were in Congaree Creek Heritage Preserve. And um, I looked on the ground because there are venomous species here. And the fellow that was interviewing me looked on the ground. And about three minutes into the interview, he asked me, hey, what, what was that? He pointed to about two feet from his, his uh, right foot. And it was a water moccasin, um, you know, a, a cotton mouth. So I, I took his arm, I grabbed him and uh, brought him up to where I was on a ridge. And uh, we uh, stayed right there and, and did the rest of the interview just standing still. <laughs> we didn't walk around anymore. But it was right by us. We both looked. And that just, you know, speaks to their amazing, amazing camouflage, uh, which has helped them survive, you know, all these, all these years. Uh, your talk just reminded me of a question we should ask everybody in the chat box. Um, if you were on our snake class last week, you may know the answer to this already, but how many poisonous snakes are in South Carolina? Ooh, and we want to use the word venomous there. Poisonous. I know, like it was a trick question, Jay. Oh, 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 
<laughs> oh no! Oh, I just messed it up. <laughs> so there are no poisonous snakes here in South Carolina. We only have venomous snakes. <laughs> oh, oh gosh, I, you know we should have gone over that before. <laughs> oh man, I'm red. I'm probably about as red as your hair right now. <laughs> All right, yeah, so, you know, poison is something that you ingest or poison is something that you, you know, touch and, uh, and, it, and it disrupts you a, a bit, but uh, venom is injected, right? Um, so sorry about that one, Shannon. Um, we'll go to the next one. So look, there's no arms, there's no legs, and I know this isn't a full, full picture here, um, but uh, it's not a snake. Uh, we have about, I think, three or four species of glass lizards that don't have uh, arms or legs like uh, other, other lizards do. So how do you how do you tell it's not a snake? Well, first you you get out there and, and you look and you you just learn things um, and you study. Uh, that's one way to do it. But then you know when when you're out and you see this, it's a little <clears throat> uh, ear opening. Well, snakes don't have that. All right, um, and their eyes actually move. So a snake's eye is fixed. It actually has a scale um, over it uh, to help protect it. Um, and, uh, but, but the lizard's eyes, they move. Um, and then again, they, they do have this external ear opening. And uh, one of my favorite places to find them is at the beach. So you, you find these Eastern glass lizards, um, a lot of times in the dunes, um, if you go out to uh, Isle of Palms or, um, you know, Sullivan's Island around the dunes, um, even in the, the, the rack uh, where, where the, the waves kind of bring in all that, <clears throat> all that stuff, right? <laughs> all that organic material from the ocean. Uh, you'll even find them in there sometimes, but, but really, really cool. Uh, sometimes they're called glass lizards because if you pick them up, sometimes they'll, they'll release the, about half of their body and it'll shatter, you know, kind of in quote shatter uh, into maybe, you know, two, two, three, four pieces. Um, and that's just, and it'll wiggle around and that's to, to help the actual lizard stay alive while the predator, you know, focuses on the, the wiggling little parts there that are left over. Um, so cool species though. So we have around um, uh, over 30 species here in South Carolina. And I just, I wanted to put both of these uh, side by side because they look so similar. And I would imagine so many of uh, water snakes here in South Carolina and in the country uh, die because um, their, their, their identity is mistaken for a cotton mouth. Um, <clears throat> so uh, I took this picture of a plain bellied water snake, which is the same, let's see, as that one, but this one's a, a beautiful, beautiful adult. Um, <clears throat> but, uh, you know, it looks menacing, right? And it's flattened out its head. And we actually had a uh, picture that was sent to us uh, this morning of a, of a water snake and, and it looked menacing as well. It was a big, it was a huge uh, adult and it flattened out its head and that's a defense, right? They don't want to be eaten by us. Uh, they don't know that we're just, we're just passing by or looking at them. Um, but uh, you can tell the difference between a, a water moccasin or a cotton mouth a, a couple ways um, from, from a water snake. Um, you see these lines right here on right on the the upper jaw um, the the cotton mouth and you can't see it here <clears throat> doesn't have that um, a cotton mouth also has these these beautiful lines that uh, kind of cover its eyes um, you know these eye lines uh, the tail of a water snake usually okay is going to be a lot longer um, than a cotton mouth the cotton mouth is is kind of chunky 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 and then it ends um, a, uh, a water snake is kind of long and tapered. Um, you know, have I ever seen a cotton mouth with a longer tail? Sure. But, you know, uh, gen general rule, you know, it, it usually has a, a, a chunky body and then all of a sudden the, the, the tail just kind of ends. Yes, ma'am. Couple questions. So the water snake, what does it do in the water? Uh, so, you know, they'll eat fish. Uh, imagine that. Uh, so, you know, it's, it's hunting. Um, uh, so they're, they're great. There's a bunch of different species here in South Carolina, I think around four or, or five perhaps. Um, but they're, they're uh, either traveling, okay, getting from one place to, to the next, um, or they are eating, right? Um, and the, the water moccasin, you know, you, you can find that in the water a lot. Um, it's usually going to be in or around the water. So 
it's one of our venomous species that, that doesn't mind the, the water too, too much. But you can see right here, uh, water moccasin, and then they also call it a common name is a cotton mouth. And it looks like, you know, the, the, the mouth is, is full of cotton. It's just a, a warning sign that says, hey, you know, don't come over here um, because I, I will bite you. But remember, these all snakes have mouths. So if you don't want to be bitten, just, just leave it alone because anything with a mouth can bite you, right? So there was a question from Margaret, which you just answered. Why is it called a cotton mouth? So Margaret, if you didn't see that, Jay said it's because of how it's its mouth looks when it's pointed up. It looks like cotton. Yeah, it'll, wants it'll, to know. it'll open its mouth. It'll open its mouth up and display that that beautiful white that's inside, and it really stands out. Think about the the habitat that these guys live in. They're they're either in swamps or floodplains, and a lot of that material is darker there. It's it's broken down. So these these uh, these snakes are can be this is actually kind of a lighter lighter one they can be a lot darker than this and all of a sudden you know you get too close it opens up its mouth and that white really pops from that habitat so it's just this really cool trait that they have um and it you know helps us not get bitten because you know they don't want to bite us they expend a lot of energy they don't want to lose that venom there's a lot of protein that that is needed to to um make it and so they don't want to, to, to bite us, um, you know, but if we handle it, if, if we step on them, obviously, you know, that's, uh, um, that's hazardous for us. Um, so they display this um, for their own protection. Um, Michael says the regular bellied water snake looks a bit like an Eastern hognose snake. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and remember, this is a juvenile. Um, but uh, yeah, and, and think about, you know, a pygmy rattlesnake, you know, I, I think sometimes they can be um, confused with a, with a hog nose. Um, but yeah, there's, there's a lot of similar species out there. But, uh, you know, if you ever want to learn more, um, we'll have a snake expert um, lead a class, um, you know, in the future, in the springtime. Um, and just it'll, it'll be all about snakes and uh, they'll, they'll be experts to, to answer, you know, all, all your questions. Um, and then Isabel wants to know how do snakes catch fish? Um, you know what? I've never seen one actually catch. So either uh, catch a fish. So either they, they are lying very, very still. Okay. Um, or they are actually going underwater. You know, that's if you, if you would like, or if we uh, rewatch this and I remember that question, um, I can ask our snake expert, Brandon Ergel and get back with you, Isabel. That's a great question. That's one that, that we haven't heard yet. And I will also put in this chat box for everybody, you have to ask your mom and your dad before you put it on their cell phones or your iPad or your computer. But there's a cool education app called Snake Snap where you can learn more about snakes, especially if you see it in your yard. Great resource. So a couple or a few non-venomous species. Uh, one of my favorite snakes is the rough green snake. We were able to, to find a few this, uh, this spring. Um, and uh, they're, they're one of our arboreal, right? Um, they, they like to be in trees. Uh, you'll find them in bushes, um, in grassy areas. You don't always find them in trees or bushes. You can find them on the ground, obviously. Um, but it's a, it's a fantastic snake. Um, you know, there's no other green snakes here in South Carolina. There is a smooth green snake. Um, and I think maybe some of their range overlaps, but we have a rough green snake um, uh, pretty commonly here in, in the South. Um, Eastern rat snake, uh, some of those get, get killed because people think they're copperheads. You can see this, this design right here. This is a pretty, uh, a darker phased one. So it's probably here around the Piedmont. Once they, you get closer to, to the coast, they, they lighten up in color significantly. Um, but this is a fantastic climber. So you'll find these in, in trees sometimes. Um, if you have a bird box that doesn't have a predator guard, a lot of times a rat snake, uh, we'll, we'll get into the box and, and eat whatever's in there. Um, so if you're trying to, to help birds reproduce, um, you know, put up a box on a pole, okay, a metal pole, and then put a predator guard, which is typically an upside down cone uh, or something similar that, that keeps snakes, raccoons, squirrels out so, you, so those birds have a better chance of, of reproducing. Um, and then you have uh, something beautiful called a black racer, which, is, which can be quite similar to an eastern rat snake. Um, but it has a little teeny pink uh, area around its snout. Um, it's a lot thinner and it's a lot faster. I mean, it's, it's appropriately named um, because it is, it is uh, I don't know if it's our fastest snake, but it's, uh, it, if, if it's not, it's pretty, pretty darn close. But it can actually eat venomous species. You see it here eating a copperhead. 
and we'll see a closer picture um, of a copperhead and, and look at the, these Hershey Kisses, um, the, these Hershey Kiss designs on the side. So if you ever see that on a snake, um, good, chance, uh, good chance that it, it's, a, it's a copperhead. But you know, if you wanna learn more, that app um, that Shannon mentioned can get you used to our um, you know, snakes that we have here in South Carolina. Um, and the Savannah River Ecology Lab has a great, great, great website um, uh, on, on, our, on our snakes um, and the snakes down in Georgia as well. Yes, ma'am. So Isabel shared a pretty cool comment that I thought others might want to know. About. She has a chicken coop and she said they found an eastern rat snake in there. And I googled that really quickly and it turns out eastern rat snakes or just rat snakes in general are sometimes called chicken snakes because they can often be found in chicken coops, mostly trying to find rats or mice. But if there aren't any, sometimes they'll go after those chicken eggs. Yeah, so if you want to see an Eastern rat snake guaranteed, just get some chickens. <laughs> um, so here's a few venomous species and, uh, and a couple lookalikes. Um, so again, I, I just love, you know, the copperhead is one of the most, in my opinion, one of the most beautiful snakes in the world, even though it's, it's just tan and brown. Um, but, you know, they, they kind of vary in, in their, their light and dark um, and then, you know, in, in their pa patterns. Um, I actually found one that had a, a stripe and, and, and then it kind of had these weird, um, you know, uh, uh, formations, you know, uh, at, the, at the bottom part of it. But you can tell by its head, it's really angular, like its cousin, the water moccasin. Um, it almost looks like it was put together with Legos. Really angular head, which is another way that you can tell it apart from a, from, uh, a water snake. Um, but uh, yeah, look at these Hershey Kisses. Can't y'all see that? Isn't that neat? Um, it's, uh, as far as I can remember, it's, it's the only snake that we have that, that has that pattern. Um, so if you see something that looks like it has Hershey Kisses, you know, don't, don't handle it. Um, and if you don't know what it is, uh, don't handle it. But this is a, uh, um, a timber rattlesnake uh, along the, the, the sand hills, I guess, and below. They sometimes call them a, a cane break rattlesnake. But um, it's 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 a timber rattlesnake, and we also have a diamondback rattlesnake, a pygmy rattlesnake, um, as well. And then this is the uh, last. I think we I've mentioned five so far, but this is our sixth venomous species. Um, that's a coral snake. Um, so you see the red on the yellow that that indicates that it's a coral snake, and then you have these two lookalikes, which are non-venomous, and you have the red on the black. Okay, the red on the black, and so this is a scarlet snake. And uh, the way that you can um, tell that it's not a scarlet king snake is these, these don't go all the way around its body. You see how these kind of form rings? They go all the way around the body. Well, this kind of forms something, I guess, you know, you could call it a saddle. Um, it, it's on the other side and it's on this side, but you can see that they don't form rings around this snake. Uh, this, is, this is the scarlet king again, and, and it has a complete ring. Um, but again, you can tell that it's not a uh, coral snake, at least here in South Carolina, because it, the red touches the black. The red touches the black. On a coral snake, uh, the red touches the yellow. Um, although I think in Central America, they do have coral snakes where that, that rhyme that you know, most of us know um, doesn't really apply. I think they do have coral snake species where um, red actually does touch the black. Um, or it doesn't touch the yellow at least, but <clears throat> I'd have to read more about that. So, but here in South Carolina, um, you know, general rule is, you know, if the red touches the black, um, it is a uh, non-venomous species, unless somebody released one um, that shouldn't be here. Um, but these snakes, these three here, uh, the closer you get to, to Charleston, there's pockets of these guys in the coastal plain. Uh, once you get up to the Piedmont area, I don't really think you get too many of these or, or these. Um, but, you know, I know around Chapin, where I live, you know, uh, our, our nanny actually had a couple of these. She sent us pictures uh, two years in a row um, of some uh, scarlet snakes. And then we had a board member in, that's in Columbia that, that sent us a picture of a scarlet snake. So, so they can be found in the Piedmont, um, but I think all, all three of them can be found, or all, all five of these actually can be found in the coastal plain of South Carolina. Beautiful snakes. So make sure your sound's on. So we have creatures of the night. It's Halloween, right? We're, uh, we're in that season. So we're gonna talk about some creatures of the night. And some of those snakes are, especially the, the, the vipers. Um, I think these guys are cute. I know that's not a very cute picture, but I think possums are, are cute. 
Uh, they have more teeth than any other mammal in North America. Um, they can play dead, and that's just a defense strategy. Um, and from what I've read, they get so scared, um, they, they freeze up. And uh, once the threat is gone, uh, if, if, if the, the predator wasn't smart enough <laughs> and didn't consume it, um, once the threat is gone, it'll, it'll you know, wake back up. Um, they'll also drool or blow snot bubbles. Um, I mean, if, if I'm a predator and I see uh, an animal blowing snot bubbles, I'm going to go to the next, to the next uh, creature, right? Uh, some of them release bodily fluids. Uh, so they will get very gross in order to survive. Um, and they're fantastic. You know, if you see a possum on your property, that is uh, a, a great benefit to your property. They eat around four to 5,000 ticks a year. Um, they can live two, three, four, five years. Um, and so, you know, you're thinking about 15, 20,000 ticks in their lifetime that they consume. So um, they, uh, I, when I was reading about possums, I think they have a, a lower chance of getting rabies because their body, their body temperature is lower than, than most mammals. Um, so, you know, they're, they're disease resistant. Um, they eat a lot of things uh, that we've already talked about, snakes. Uh, rodents, insects, um, they'll eat some plants, uh, but great, great animal. Um, and if you have a bird or a, a, a screech owl box or a, a barred owl box in your, on your property, or maybe just a natural cavity in a tree, oftentimes, you know, they'll, they'll seek uh, shelter in those. Um, I've found them in, um, you know, brush piles. I've found them in uh, where old stumps were and they decomposed and they left this nice little hole in the ground. Um, you find them in all these little cavities um, or, or very thick areas on your property, or you can. Um, and, and let's listen to the sound of one. So, you know, they might be cute, but that sound isn't cute. It kind of sounds like a buddy of mine after, after uh, too much Mexican. So. Uh, and, and look, the Eastern Stripe skunk, we have those, we have skunks here in South Carolina. Um, oftentimes you'll see them hit on the road um, and they're, they're often hit, you know, at night when they're crossing. Um, and a fact about a skunk, my wife and I, we're kind of weird. We love the way a skunk smells. So if there is one hit on the road, you know, we feel sorry for it, but we both inhale deeply. And uh, I just thought I'd share that with you guys. Um, don't judge us. Um, they are in the same family as weasels. <clears throat> um, uh, and like the possum, they will eat plants and animals. Um, so again, when you're thinking about these snakes um, or that uh, praying mantis um, and, and, and you're, you're, you have a fear of them and you kill them or you think they're gross, you know, you're taking food away from, from something, okay? You're taking food away from something. Um, so, you know, think, think twice about um, taking the life of, of, a, of an animal that's, that's on your property. Um, and they can spray that liquid up to 15 feet. So if you, if you see that tail up, if you see it down, you know, you're, you're probably in good shape. But if you see that tail up, you know, you, you might want to back up, uh, you know, 16 feet. <laughs> and, uh, you know, a barred owl, one of, one of our owls, our, our most common owls that we have in South Carolina, I'll play that sound in a little bit. Um, but beautiful, beautiful owl and uh, just, a, just a really neat sound that they make um, that you can hear at night and, and even during the day. If you're going to see an owl during the day or you hear an owl during the day, most, most uh, times it's going to be uh, the barred owl. And that was the eastern striped skunk. All right, so a great horned owl, and I want, I want y'all to, to read these here, this one and this one, and see if you can hear this. So the, the great horned owl, these are called mnemonics. We use these, they're just devices um, that we use to remember bird songs. Um, and so, you know, even owls have these, or we can apply these to owls too. So see if you can hear who's asleep, me too. So did y'all hear that? Who's asleep? Me too. And this one's called a whinny because it sounds like a little mini horse. It's an Eastern screech owl. <laughs> and 
And that trill, trill at the end doesn't sound like a, like a Winnie, but <clears throat> uh, it's one of its calls. And this one uh, was, uh, you know, we had them two years in a row uh, um, using our Screech Owl box. Um, and a buddy of mine, Zach Steinhauser, uh, took this picture um, of what looks like a pretty annoyed Eastern Screech Owl, right? <laughs> and so the barred owl, um, you know, where this one to me, you know, sounds like a kind of a buttery French horn. This one sounds like a blaring trumpet or a trombone. Uh, so see if you can hear who cooks for you, who cooks for y'all. Isn't that neat? And so sometimes you'll be out and let me play this real fast and you just kind of hear them go bananas um, uh, oftentimes during the during the mating season. So I, uh, so I think they forgot that they were owls and they thought they, they were crows there for a second. But uh, yes, ma'am. Well, I'm just jumping on to say that not enough people were surprised by all these owl sounds because I used to only think that owls said, whoo, whoo, and I was wrong. Did anybody else, is anybody else surprised by all these different noises that these owls make? Yeah, and then you have in, uh, a less common barn owl. This one's a barred owl, but we have a barn owl as well, which is white. It has these beautiful discs on, on its face that just has this weird screech, uh, which I guess would have been appropriate for Halloween now that I think about it. But uh, it's such an uncommon, um, uh, their species has declined pretty dramatically. <clears throat> um, there's there are certain areas that you can go to to, to see and hear those owls, um, but uh, I haven't heard one around the, the Midlands yet. We do have a couple people that were also surprised by all these noises, but we also have some smarty pants that already knew. So. Hey, that's great. <laughs> yep, we have some nature lovers. That's fantastic. All right. Well, you know what, Shannon? We're going to test them right now. All right. Because I have no pictures. Um, and y'all listen up, turn the sound up and see if you know what, what makes this. Or you tell us, you tell Shannon in that chat box what makes this, this sound. South Carolina. There's nothing in the chat box yet. All right, and I can only play that once or it'll go to the next one, but any guesses, y'all? There's a guess for alligator. Come on, throw out your guesses. Hold on. Oh, now. man. So, yeah, an American alligator. So, good job. <clears throat> um, you get a point. All right, so here's the next sound. We've got some guesses for possum. Keep Ooh. guessing. Keep guessing. It's not a possum. All right, here it is, guys. So we have a black bear, right? Um, and you know what? They'll they'll um, navigate the the low country. They'll come right. Uh, I've been living in Chapin for six years, and we've gotten emails in the community from the police department uh, twice on two occasions, different years, that there was a black bear uh, in Chapin, um, right right around the neighborhood uh, that that that's behind us. So, uh, and then obviously, you know, when you get to the mountains, so they're kind of distributed throughout the. Uh, the the state although the ones that we typically see around here they don't live here they're just they're just passing through um and here's the the last sound all right what do y'all have there a lot of people are saying frog ooh frog anything else there's a toad hmm hmm you know, and, and these sounds, if I was if I was outside, especially by myself, and I heard one of these, uh, you know, I'm, I might just turn around and go back inside. But this one's made by a, a really, really cool bird called an anhinga. Um, and, you know, they call it a snake bird or a water turkey, um, but it has this huge uh, long neck and, and, and the body a lot of times will be submerged. So you just see this long neck with this dagger-like thin needle bill. 
Um, and uh, that's why they call it a snake bird, but it, it hunts fish. And uh, I don't have a picture of it um, impaling the fish with, uh, with its bill, but you know, that's what they do. They'll swim, <clears throat> um, strike a fish, uh, and then, and then, you know, uh, consume it afterwards. Uh, but really, really cool bird. Uh, if you're along the coast, you, you find them all over the place down there. Um, here in Columbia, you can find them in, in uh, areas that have still water. Um, even on Lake Murray, uh, when you get to these back coves that don't have any houses, um, you'll, you'll see one kind of perched up. And I've actually heard them call that call that you just heard, you know, uh, here on the lake. So, uh, you know, we have over 400 bird species here in South Carolina that have been recorded. So uh, think about that. Um, how, many, how many can you list or, or name? Um, and that's not a question you have to answer on the chat box or anything, but think about that. Think about all the ones that are out there. We're, we're talking about 400 different species that have been recorded here in South Carolina. And how many do you know about? We, we have purple birds, we have pink birds, we have green birds. We have a bird that is red, green, yellow, and blue. Um, I mean, you know, who, who knew that these things existed, right? Um, but get out and, uh, and, and find it. Um, but yeah, I just love these sounds and y'all had some good guesses. You did trick a lot of people with that last one. There's a lot of wows and what's and a bird <laughs> made that. So good, good job there, Jay. All right, all right. All right, and let's let's talk bats. Um, you know, I'm not a bat expert. Um, there is a great biologist that works with South Carolina DNR <clears throat> that studied that has studied bats, and um, you know, we need to have her. Um, maybe we can have her teach a class. So, um, you know, if you ask a, a question, I might not know the answer, but I did. You know, it, it's it's a Halloween type of class. We're talking about creepy crawlies. I mean, every Halloween. Um, decoration I've ever seen, you know, probably had a bat on it. So I wanted to talk a little bit about them. Um, you know, and they- it, it is five, so we know, I know a couple people are gonna have to jump off, but if you can hang with us, um, we'll try and stay back and answer questions and Jay will get through this last little portion for you. Yeah, yeah, and I'll kind of, you know, um, pick it up a little bit, but um, they are the only mammals, okay, um, that are capable of true flight, okay? We do have, um, a mammal that can kind of, you know, in quotes, fly in South Carolina and in other parts of the world, and that's a flying squirrel, right? But it doesn't really fly, right? It, it just kind of glides. Um, but these, you know, can actually flap their wings and, and stay up for hours and hours if they, if they need to or want to. Um, but we have around 14 species here in South Carolina. Uh, most of them eat insects, but some will eat fruit, um, nectar, small mammals, birds, lizards, frogs, and fish. Um, you know, a lot of people say, hey, they're great at taking care of mosquitoes. Um, you know, the, I think more study ne studies need to, to be done to determine that. Um, you know, the smaller bats, you know, will consume mosquitoes. The larger bats might not, you know, expend a, uh, as much energy chasing a, a tiny mosquito when they can take a, you know, a bird or a mammal or a big juicy moth. Um, they get a lot more fat nutrition, you know, from, from those larger um, uh, insects or, or prey than they would, would you know, with these tiny mosquitoes. Um, in 2013, uh, I think our, the first case of white nose syndrome, which is a fungus that affects and, you know, kills um, these, these bats, was detected. <clears throat> um, and the tricolored bat um, experienced 94% decline uh, in two of the largest known uh, hibernacula in the state. Um, and that, that's just areas that they hibernate in. Um, so they, I know DNR and, and some biologists study these um, hibernacula where, where these, these bats hibernate again um, in the winter months because that's when that fungus is, is most prevalent. Um, you know, in the, in the warmer months, um, you know, it, it doesn't like that, that, the, the heat. Um, so it's typically, I don't think it's as, as big of a problem, but in the wintertime, um, it can really devastate these, these bats and it'll, it'll grow on their a snout. Um, and, their, and their face and, and some of their wings, and it actually wakes them up from hibernation, and they expend a lot of energy um, and, and use a lot of their fat reserves, and they end up passing away. So that's, that's how that works. So, um, you know, they're, they're working hard uh, to, you know, to, to figure this out, and hopefully there will be a way to uh, combat that white nose syndrome in the future. So happy Halloween, guys. This is a, uh, another picture from a great photographer, Vance Solseth, who taught a photography class um, earlier this year. But it's another green link spider. And, uh, you know, this one kind of shows you why I don't want to touch spiders uh, often, unless it's one of those jumping spiders. But uh, come on, uh, if that doesn't scream Halloween, what does? But uh, 
you know, from a distance, and that distance might only be six inches. I love looking at these guys. Um, and there's all sorts of things out there for y'all to explore, experience. And in my opinion, it's going to make your life a lot more enjoyable. Um, so get out there and, and explore and uh, see, what, see what you find out there. But that, uh, again, another green link spider right there. And finally, the last, the last slide here, and there's another picture of an Anhinga. Um, you can find us on Facebook and Instagram um, and Twitter. Um, you can go to our website if you want to learn more about native plants, why they're so beneficial, uh, which ones that you can install on your property, um, all sorts of animals. Um, there's, there's all sorts of great information on there. If you want to sign up for other classes, look at the ones that we have had in the past on our YouTube channel. Um, we have all sorts of resources on our website right here. But if you're not following us on, on Instagram um, or Facebook, please, please do. Um, a little bit about what we do besides, you know, uh, holding classes. Uh, uh, before COVID, we would go, uh, last year, we started going in, into schools. And uh, this is our snake expert, Brandon Ergel. He's a great guy, great friend of mine, and uh, just knows his stuff. So he would talk about snakes. I would talk about birds and play funky sounds and uh, get some laughs and get a lot of interest from the kids. And, uh, you know, once, once COVID is a thing of the past, um, or at least controlled, you know, we'll, we'll go back into the schools again. But my goal, our, our goal um, as an organization is, is to see at least a couple thousand kids each year and uh, hopefully uh, get them to fall in love with nature. Uh, Project Prothonotary, uh, the Prothonotary Warbler is the one that I was being interviewed about um, a few weeks ago, and, and we were in this place right here, Congaree Creek Heritage Preserve in Lexington, uh, Lexington County. Um, we've put up around, or will be 290 boxes by the end of this, this winter in a, in a couple years <clears throat> um, to help that bird out. Um, and look, everybody's got a smile on their face. You know, conservation is fun. It's fantastic. Look, I'm smiling. Abel's smiling. Brian's smiling. Uh, Alex is smiling. Everybody's smiling. Conservation is fun. Um, and we enjoy, we enjoy helping animals out. Uh, and, you know, one of my favorite things is getting kids out. So that's just us. We were looking at a summer tanager, and that's a bird that I mentioned earlier that loves to eat wasps, bees, um, and dragonflies. And we, we were trying to, I was trying to show them one in a tree, um, and we eventually found it. Uh, trash cleanups. Um, you, you look at this anhinga, remember that's the snake bird. That was the, the, the sound that a lot of folks, you know, couldn't, couldn't recognize. Uh, earlier that I played. Uh, but this, this has some plastic around its mouth uh, that was taken here in Irmo um, in, a, in a pond behind Home Depot. And, you know, that, that bird works really hard to survive. And unfortunately, you know, it's probably not with, uh, with this binding its, its bill together. So, you know, we try to get the word out about pollution and we try to clean up pollution as much as we can. And then uh, the advocacy part of, of what SCWF does. Um, you look at this, Governor, this is from uh, News 19, Governor signs new law to protect South Carolina turtles and reptiles uh, and amphibians. So it makes it <clears throat> uh, hopefully more difficult um, for uh, illegal poaching of our turtles um, and, and other reptiles and amphibians um, to be sold in the black market. You think about an Eastern box turtle fetching, you know, maybe a thousand dollars or more. Um, in the black market. Um, and this makes it illegal to do that. So uh, we get behind those things that protect, protect nature. Um, so that's who we are. And uh, if you like this class and you like who we are, uh, parents out there, please support us financially. We're a nonprofit and just go to uh, scwf.org to do so. And we appreciate it. Yeah. And um, just to follow up on what Jay said, if you found all the logos, um, while you were watching the slideshow. I put my email in um, the chat box. You should also have it from getting the class notes um, and login details. So go ahead and send me an email if you found all the logos. Um, also, part of what we do at the South Carolina Wildlife Federation is we work with the National Wildlife Federation and they have a super fun magazine and website called Ranger Rick that has even more awesome animal facts. So I'll make sure to send a link out um, for that. Um, if you've never seen Ranger Rick before, or if your school would like some Ranger Rick magazines, let me know and we can also try and help you get some Ranger Rick magazines to your school too. But if anybody's got any questions, we've got some time and we'll answer a couple of them for you. No questions just yet. And, uh, and, and guys, if there's a, 
you know, if you have a class and you want me to teach a, teach a class uh, to your class, um, you know, I'm going to do that for the first time, I think, either next week or the week after um, with my youngest uh, kindergarten class. So uh, we're going to do it through Google. Um, Google Meets, I think is what it's called. And I'm going to teach seven, seven kindergarten classes at once. So if y'all want me to speak at your school, uh, you know, I probably can't come in person. But if you want me to, to speak to the class uh, through, you know, the computer, um, I'd be uh, really happy to do that. So just get in touch with us. And uh, I, I would I would love to do that. Yeah, you can send an email back to the email that I'll send with the class recording. If you want to get in touch with Jay, we will make that possible for you. Any questions out there, Shannon? Let's see. Jay, do you want to give um, everybody a reminder on what your Halloween costume is for those who missed it at the beginning? You know, this is, uh, I'm stretching it here, but I am wax myrtle, which is a native plant that we have here in South Carolina. I love it. Um, you know, it's, uh, it has broad leaves, um, but it does keep its leaves throughout the year. It just drops them kind of, you know, periodically, I guess. Um, but it has these beautiful berries uh, that, that folks used to make candles out of, and I guess they still do, but uh, one of my uh, favorite things about this, it provides cover for, for wildlife, but it also provides food in these little berries, and uh, a really great bird called a yellow rump warbler uh, comes to this uh, plant in the, in the uh, winter, winter time and feeds on those berries. So if you don't have wax myrtle on your property, and it's a pretty easy one to, to plant, it's uh, drought, drought tolerant, um, it's, it's a great plant to install on your property because it provides cover, it provides uh, food um, in multiple forms, and uh, it, it's, a, it's a fun one to watch. So I am Wax Myrtle with a little copperhead. He's hiding in it too. Amazing. And I'm dressed up as Poison Ivy for those that missed it. Um, so we are both plants that you can find here in South Carolina. Daniel says he's got another question. Um, I'm going to go ahead and 